Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another conversation again tonight with Marty Ross, MD. Uh, good to be back here. I've been uh, uh, away from you for a couple of weeks, and I've uh, been looking forward to spending some time uh, talking about Lyme disease and ask, answering the, the many questions that you have. We'll also talk about mold toxicity illness, I'm sure, tonight and any other topic you want to get into. And I'll try to answer those questions to the best of my ability. Sometimes you stump me, and uh, so. But when you stump me, there's things that mean it means there's things I need to look into and learn a little bit more. And uh, so it always provides a good reason for me to go back and study things a bit more too. For those of you that are new here, welcome. And I'm also glad to see a number of uh, familiar names on my message board as well too. Uh, the way that you participate in these webinars are two main ways. Number one. Uh, you can uh, listen to the questions as I read them and see what answers I give. And there's always some good learning that happens with that. I tend to talk a lot. <laughs> I give long-winded answers, but in there, try to educate in some way. Um, the other way that you can uh, participate is to actually write a question. And where you do that is over on the right-hand side of the screen at the bottom, there's a chat box. You can write your question there. The only thing I ask as you write your question, do not hit the enter key until the whole thing is done. So don't use your enter key to create separate paragraphs. If you do that, it actually sends separate questions to me that get to be really hard to follow from my side. Tonight, I am creating a recording as usual, and 99.99% uh, .99 of the time, those recordings go as planned, and we actually have something to prepare for you. Uh, tonight, I'll be editing that up and pulling out uh, the, the, the long beginning that sometimes records. So a quick edit, and then tomorrow morning, I'll write a summary of it and send out uh, a link, an email to you that will have a link to the recording along with a summary of what we talked about uh, tonight. I know a number of people have been asking me to timestamp them. I hope you understand I'm the only person processing anything here. <laughs> so uh, it takes a while to go through, create the summary, and it would even take longer to do timestamps. So I, I don't have the time to do the timestamps on that. Um, I hope you understand that, but I hope by at least doing the summary that can give you a way to hop through the different topics, uh, listen to a section of the tape briefly and see what topic you're in and then kind of find the section you want to listen to. In tomorrow morning's email, there'll be a chance to sign up for the next webinar, which will be next week. And um, yeah, I think that's it. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, during the webinar, if you're participating in the live version, uh, you will actually get a chance to see the questions on your screen. So I just posted one, so you should be able to see that. Realize that in the recorded version, they don't show up, so I actually read the questions as well, too. So here we go. Uh, hi, David. This is, hi, Dr. Ross. Have you used wall call 625 as a mold binder? Was it successful? How many times a day did you prescribe for best results? I've been on it for a little over a month, taking it two times a day. After taking it for one month, I began to feel worse and now feel fatigue and crappy. Is this normal? Are these symptoms a result of the toxins being removed from the body? Thanks. All right. So uh, basically, well call is similar to a powder called cholesteramine. Um, they essentially are the same thing. Uh, well call would be more the pill version of that. And um, I have used it rarely, though. I usually tend to use more of the powder, the cholesteramine powder. Uh, when I'm using either cholesteramine or well call, I usually will start people at taking it one time a day. And after they start showing some ability to handle that, then I will increase it up to two times a day. The grandfather of multoxicity illness and using binders to get rid of them is a physician named Richie Shoemaker. And Richie would actually have people take it three and four times a day. Uh, but Richie didn't take care of a lot of people with chronic Lyme. And when you have chronic Lyme, it's really difficult to tolerate doing it more than twice a day uh, because pulling those toxins out can make you worse, uh, especially when you have Lyme um, on board. So twice a day is usually about what I maximize out at. 625 milligrams seems like a reasonable dose. When I start people either on the powder or the well call, I'll have you start it once a day. And what I try to do with that is I tell people to be on it for at least seven days. And if it doesn't flare them up, then go ahead and increase up to twice a day from there. Okay. Now, it takes time to remove mold toxins. And you people usually don't recover just with a month of doing this. Okay. It often can be six months. 
a year or more sometimes. It just takes time to pull those toxins out. And my advice is to pull them out at a rate you can tolerate. So to part of your question here, one of the things that happens when we start moving, pulling those mold toxins out of you with the binders is your, your body will see these moving toxins and your immune system will see that. And it will make and manufacture more of those chemicals called cytokines that you've heard me talk about in the past. For those of you that haven't heard me talk about cytokines in the past, let me talk about that real quickly. So your white blood cells, uh, whenever they see an infection or they see mold toxins in you, will manufacture chemicals called cytokines. They'll even make it when you get the COVID vaccine or if you get COVID, okay? It's a chemical, cytokines are chemical messengers that the immune system uses to tell other parts of the immune system to get active, to draw them to where that infection or that mold toxin is, and to help them get rid of it, okay, or to work better. The trouble is in mold toxicity illness and in Lyme and in too many yeast living in you, sometimes in small intestine bacteria overgrowth, and sometimes in COVID, your immune system makes too many cytokines. And when you get too many cytokines, it gives you fatigue, brain fog, your body hurts, um, poor sleep, uh, difficult thinking, et cetera. Okay, all those symptoms we call Lyme symptoms are really too many cytokines, okay? Now, mold toxicity symptoms are also too many cytokines. And also when you start pulling those toxins out, you trigger more cytokines. So you might start getting more fatigue and more body pain, okay? There are people that manage this illness that tell their patients never to flare up when they're pulling it out. So for instance, Dr. Neil Nathan, who's one of the um, people that writes a lot about mold toxicity illness, advises people not to, to take as, uh, enough of the binders that they would flare. Um, I don't quite take that viewpoint. I think it's okay to flare moderately, but I don't want be having people clobbered, okay? So if I do have somebody that's flaring because of the increased cytokines, and that's what I wonder could be happening with you here, David. And granted, you should talk to your own doctor about this to see what they think, because I don't know all the nuances about you, okay? But um, when I see somebody that's flaring when they're on binders, what I wanna try to do is have them take things that are gonna control those cytokines better. And the main two things that I would have somebody do, uh, number one is to take curcumin, a curcumin is a component of the Indian seasoning turmeric. It gets inside of your white blood cells and limits their ability to make cytokines. The product I like for that is a product made by Thorne called Mariva 500. And I have people take one pill three times a day. If they start flaring from a cytokine surge, either from killing germs, that's called a Herxheimer reaction when it flare, cytokines flare for killing germs, or if they start flaring because we're pulling toxins out, I'll have a person double it to two of the 500 milligram pills three times a day, okay? All right. The second, oh, and the reason I like this Thorn product called Mariva 500 is it is a liposomal form of a curcumin, meaning it's a curcumin that's microscopically wrapped in fat to help increase its absorption, okay? All right. The other thing I'll have people do if they're flaring, especially when we're pulling mold, uh, mold toxins out, is I'll have them uh, start taking uh, liposomal glutathione. Again, that's glutathione, that's microscopically wrapped in fat. Now, glutathione is a very strong antioxidant that is made in every one of our cells. Its job is to uh, repair injury from cell damage, but also it's a good detoxing agent. In fact, it's the number one detox chemical used by the liver. So it can help when you're having problems too. It's an, it mainly as an antioxidant, it helps lower oxidation signals that tell white blood cells to make cytokines. So it blocks the messenger, okay? So the way you would use that is a liposomal uh, variety. And for that, I usually like using a product by research nutritionals called TriFortify. It's got great research showing good absorption. That's why you want a liposomal variety. Some people can't tolerate that. And if they can't because of the taste, I recommend another product, which is made by Pure Encapsulations. It's their liposomal glutathione. But for their product, I usually recommend doing two pills uh, one time a day. The Research Nutritionals product, I recommend doing a teaspoonful uh, one time a day, okay? So if you're really flaring up as you pull the binders out, at a minimum, I would bump up your anti-cytokine work. 
And if that's not enough, then you may consider decreasing the binders. But for all of this, David, talk to your doctor. I'm not your doctor. I can only give you general recommendations here um, during the webinar. Okay? All right. Good luck to you, David. Thanks for your question. So for those of you that are wondering what the heck these cytokines are, let me just do a quick screen share here. Oops, that's I didn't get this set up right. Hold on here just a minute. I forgot to set up my screen share. Hold on, I got to give you a brief second here, everyone. All right, let's try this again. There we go. All right, so this is uh, the treat line by Marty Ross, MD. And um, this is my Lyme disease information site. Uh, take a look at my online Lyme guide here, where I talk about Herxheimer and cytokines down here in this section. And take a look at this article called Control Cytokines, A Guide to Fix Lyme Symptoms and the Immune System. Okay. If you also want to read more about what I've written about mold detoxification and mold toxicity syndrome, take a look at my detoxification section here. And then take a look at this article called Mold Toxin Illness and Lyme Disease. Or I'm sorry, Mold and Lyme Toxin Illness. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you. All right, so hello, Megan. Let's see. Hi, Marty. Um, have you seen SIBO to be an obstacle and cure for Lyme and Bartonella in your practice? I've tried all treatments that should have worked with antibiotics and antimicrobials, uh, clearing mold and metals, but have never addressed my hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide SIBO, which is very active. Thanks. Shane, that's a good question. Um, and my viewpoint has been changing over time on this one. Um, so I'll just start by saying that. So and I'm going to answer that. <laughs> so everyone, SIBO stands for small intestine bacteria overgrowth. And uh, basically, your small intestines are not supposed to have too many bacteria in them or even yeast in them, okay? You have small amounts, but they're not supposed to have many. If you start getting too many bacteria there that have worked their way up from the large intestines or yeast that have worked their way up from the large intestines, we call that small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, or we call it small intestinal fungal overgrowth of its yeast. Okay, so that's CFO and SIBO. All right. All right. Now, what happens when you have these germs that aren't supposed to be there is it can make you very gassy. Okay, that's the main and uh, and the and these bacteria ferment sugars and they can produce a lot of hydrogen gas. They can even produce a lot of methane gas or they produce mixtures of both. Methane producing SIBO, when you make excess amounts of uh, methane, that tends to give you a lot of constipation too. Okay, so if, you've got some, if I have someone in practice that has been having some gassiness and a lot of constipation, I'm thinking methane SIBO, okay? Now, the way you figure out if you have SIBO is uh, one of, there's two main ways to do it. Number one uh, is to do what's known as a breath test where you drink in some sugar water. And after you've drank that water in over the course of two hours, if you're not constipated or three hours, if you have constipation, you collect your breath about every, I think every half hour or so. You breathe into these tubes and you collect your breath. And then they measure how much hydrogen and methane is in there. And if you have excessive rise in those levels, we then say you have SIBO. Okay, now, of the two kinds of SIBO, uh, hydrogen producing is the easiest to treat. And generally about 70% of the time, you can get rid of that in about two weeks to a month, okay? The methane producing variety is usually about two months and is it doesn't always go away with two months of treatment. Sometimes you have to go longer with that. The breath test that I just talked about will find SIBO if you have it about 70% of the time. So it's not the greatest. I mean, it's missing 30% of cases, okay? The gold standard way uh, to do this is actually to have a gastroenterologist and intestine specialist see you 
and they pass a scope into your small intestines and they draw out some of the liquid, some of the a a liquid aspirate, and they try to see how many bacteria are actually there, how much fungus is actually there. So they count it, okay? A lot of gastroenterologists won't do that, but that's technically the gold standard. All right, so what does that have to do with feeling sick even after you've done a bunch of treatments, okay? So remember, um, at the beginning of this, or earlier tonight, I was talking about mold toxicity and Lyme and yeast, all triggering cytokines, all right? So the thing is, all of those illnesses can look a lot alike. Bartonella triggers cytokines. It can look like these. So Bartonella, Babesia, Lyme, um, chronic active virus infections, uh, COVID, all these things produce, have your immune system make too many cytokines. Now it can look the same. One of the things that I'm increasingly starting to see in my practice as I become more knowledgeable about SIBO and work with SIBO is that SIBO can also be a cause of excessive cytokines. And I, as I've started looking at it for it more and working within my practice, I sometimes find the person that um, I've, I've done a lot of time treating their yeast, their mold, their uh, Lyme, their Bartonella, and they're not getting better. If I start looking at their SIBO, if they have it, and I start treating it, often that can be the key thing that gets them better because the SIBO, again, can lead to an overproduction of cytokines in the immune system and can make it look like that, that you have active Lyme or active Bartonella, when in fact, what you really have is too many cytokines triggered by SIBO. So to answer your question, sometimes getting rid of SIBO, uh, Megan, will be the thing that gets you well. If you've done everything else to treat your tick-borne illnesses, your mold toxicity, et cetera, you're still not doing well and you got SIBO, sometimes getting rid of SIBO will, will be that last uh, hurdle that you have to cross, okay? Not all the time, but quite a bit, actually, okay? All right. So everyone that's new to the idea of SIBO and wants to know more about how you diagnose it, but how do you treat it, I have a whole article on that one too. And so let's go here. So take a look at my, um, I think I tucked that one into my stomach and intestines chapter. Hmm. There it is. So here's my article on small intestine bacteria overgrowth and Lyme disease, okay? Also, if you have a lot of intestinal dysfunction, take a look at this article too called Intestinal Dysfunction Symptoms Tests and Treatments where I help you try to figure out, is it yeast? Is it um, SIBO? Is it parasites? How do you know what's going on that's giving you that gassiness, bloating, and cramping? I walk through that in this article, okay? All right, let's see here. There we are. Okay, so, oops, hold on here a minute. What's going on there? Huh, why is that not going away? All right, good. I'm sorry, I was trying to get something close on my screen. It wasn't going away. But anyhow, it has now. All right, uh, good luck to you, Megan. Hello, Albert. Hi, Dr. Ross. I know you like curcumin and glutathione for general inflammation. Is that also what you would recommend for neural inflammation? As there, um, or is there anything else that would you add for this? Also, I've heard that NAD is a major cofactor that helps recycle glutathione, and that buildup of oxidized glutathione will block mitochondrial function. So if liposomal glutathione is working, but then seems to stop working, you need to add liposomal NAD because you aren't recycling the glutathione. Curcumin and glutathione were helping me, but now my symptoms of pain and inflammation are back. And I'm wondering if this is why. I'd love to know your thoughts. Can you recommend a liposomal NAD supplement? All right. So inflammation, uh, yes, for even neurologic inflammation, like using curcumin, 
Um, I also like using uh, glutathione as well too. Uh, curcumin has another benefit for neurologic inflammation in that it may help lower another inflammatory chemical in the brain called quinolinic acid, okay? In addition, it lowers all those cytokines. In terms of your idea here that, um, that worsening pain may be due to not being able to recycle the glutathione, I'm not sure about that. I, I haven't seen that theory before. Um, so I'm, I, I don't know whether you, that's right or wrong. I don't, I, uh, again, there's a lot of ideas that people have in this field. I'm not familiar with that one. I, I'd be glad to take a look at it. Remember I said tonight, you may stump me. <laughs> All right, I learned things through your ideas. So I can't say for sure whether that's right or wrong. And, and I don't know uh, about a liposomal NAD supplement, okay? I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. The one thing though, if what I find in my practice, if somebody has been doing a lot better with inflammation, uh, for whatever the reason is, Lyme, Martinella, and suddenly they get worse. And especially if sometime in the last year or so they've been on antibiotics, start looking to see if you haven't developed too many yeast in your intestines. Because uh, having been on antibiotics, and that can be even herbal antibiotics, set you up to grow too many yeast in your intestines. When you develop too many yeast in your intestines, that triggers more cytokine production that will bring out inflammatory symptoms anywhere in the body, okay? So um, to help look at whether you might have too many yeast, you might wanna take a look at the article I have on that. And you would take a look at my section on yeast here and read this article called A Silent Problem Is It Yeast? I review when you would start thinking about yeast, the kind of symptoms that make you wonder about yeast. And um, there's even a screening tool in here you can use that you can score. And if you score high enough, that can be an indicator of yeast. And if you think you have it, then take a look at my article over here about how to get rid of yeast. Okay. All right. Thanks for the question, Albert. Good luck to you. Hello, Lynn. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. My daughter had some kind of organic acid test that showed arabidose was a little high. Her doctor at that time said that was a marker for aspergillus. He said it was one of 10 mold markers on the test and all the tests were negative. I know you've talked about arabidose being a marker for yeast but I'm wondering whether you think this organic acid test also measures mold and what you would recommend as a next step. Should she treat for yeast, for aspergillus, do more testing? Thanks for all your help. Okay. So um, organic acids are an area, um, if I've worked with them, I have a lot of frustration with them, uh, to be honest. I don't think that all the things they're purported to tell us are always true because I don't think it works out based on what I see clinically in my practice. So I know a number of doctors and even I in the past had advocated looking at arabidose as uh, an organic acid that is made by yeast, for instance. I've gone back in and looked more extensively at the literature on that and the science supporting that is not that good, to be honest. It's, it's um, the arabidose may have other causes besides yeast. So when it becomes positive, that doesn't necessarily mean you have yeast or not, to be honest with you, okay? Could arabidose be made by aspergillus? Possibly. If I'm wanting to know if somebody has a mold toxicity issue, what I'm going to wind up doing now is to get a urine test to measure mold toxins in your urine. And the two companies that do that one is called Real-Time Labs. The other one is uh, Great Plains Lab, who happens to do this uh, urine organic acid test too. My preference in doing it these days is to use the real-time labs. I think that I get a, um, a more broad uh, set of findings. Um, it's a better uh, test at finding mold toxicity if it's there, okay? All right. Um, so I would recommend if you wanna look further to see if there's a mold toxin problem, look and see if, um, 
there is uh, do a real time urine mycotoxin test. Okay, now. Besides having toxins from a mold in you, some people get colonized by these molds, so either up here in their nose passages or in the intestinal tract. And some doctors would say that if, you're, uh, if your uh, arabidose is up, that must mean you're colonized, meaning it's living in you. But I'm skeptical about the science behind that, okay? The best I can say on that. All right. Good luck, Lynn, and good luck to your daughter. Hello, Doug. Hold on here just a minute. All right, let's see here. Dr. Ross, thank you for hosting these invaluable webinars. I have real-time labs, mold tests that clearly indicating that I don't have a mold problem as confirmed by my prior Lyme literate doctor. My functional medicine doctor is insisting that a real-time lab or Great Plains lab test is insufficient to establish the presence or absence of mold. She had me do a VCS vision test as an additional data point, which I apparently failed. That test requires me to determine patterns of lines or waves in a box. Many of the items I had to evaluate were barely visible. While I wear glasses, my vision is fine. We are waiting on blood labs that she will also use in her determination. She indicated that the functional medicine community is split on whether the real-time and Great Plains labs are sufficient by themselves. What is your view? And have you heard this VCS vision test? Thank you. All right. So what I will tell you is there are um, two schools of thinking about mold toxicity illness. There is a camp of us of which I tend to be in, although I learned the other way too, but the, the camp of us, including Dr. Nathan, Neil Nathan, who writes a lot about this, that do rely on the urine mold toxin studies. They are a way of seeing what's really in you. This VCS test and the blood testing that your functional medicine doctor is doing are based on um, a viewpoint that is, was put together by a doctor named Richie Shoemaker. Richie is the first physician that started really working a lot with mold toxicity illness. And he's a very opinionated physician that has uh, educated a lot of doctors that follow his way. Most of us that treat Lyme disease and chronic infections like Lyme have found that his theory is inadequate when it comes to looking at mold toxicity within Lyme disease, okay? This VCS test that he did with you is called a visual contrast study. And it's something that Dr. Shoemaker advocates. It's actually a test that was first uh, developed by the US military as a means of looking to see if somebody might have uh, neurotoxins in them. It didn't say whether it was mold or not. So uh, it's a test that is not precise, but if it does come back that you have difficulty then it indicates you could have a mold toxin problem. It doesn't mean you do, okay? So failing it is not proof you have a mold toxin problem, okay? Now, the next steps in a shoemaker protocol to see if you might have mold toxicity is to measure a number of inflammatory chemicals that can become elevated if you have mold toxicity. The difficulty is they also can become elevated if you have chronic Lyme and chronic Bartonella. And Dr. Shoemaker does not believe in chronic Lyme and chronic Bartonella. So often he and his disciples will misdiagnose mold toxicity based upon these inflammatory markers when in fact they're probably being caused by chronic Lyme and chronic Bartonella, okay? So the problem with following a shoemaker way of doing it, which is what your doctor looks like they're doing, is that just if these inflammatory chemicals are off, does not prove mold, it just says you have something triggering ongoing inflammation, which might be mold, but it might also be Bartonella, it might also be Lyme, it might also be tick-borne illnesses, okay? So these additional chemicals that they're gonna measure, uh, one, 
is Dr. Shoemaker is going to wind up um, having his physicians will wind up doing something called an HLA-DR test, which looks to see, do you have a genetic profile that could lead to you having mold toxicity issues? Uh, it basically says that genetically you might be programmed in a way that your immune system can't break down mold toxins, okay? Now, having a genetic roadmap does not mean that you actually develop the problem, all right? So just having genetic profile doesn't mean the problem will manifest actually, okay? So all of his disciples run around saying, oh my God, you've got the HLA pattern for mold toxicity. Well, having the pattern doesn't mean you develop the problem, okay? So that's why many of us want to do the urine test to see do you really have mold toxins in you, not do you have a predisposition, okay? The other test that they will wind up doing, one is called a C4A, they might do a C3A, they might do a VEGF, they might do a, um, oh boy, a TGF beta one. These are tests that they're gonna measure, okay? And these are all can be elevated if you have mold toxicity, but they might also be elevated if you have chronic infections like Lyme too, okay? So, I don't agree with that functional doctor's approach, but they're probably a functional doctor that doesn't work a lot within the world of tick-borne illnesses as well, too, I would suspect, okay? All right. Most of us that work within the realm of tick-borne illnesses understand that tick-borne illnesses kind of messes up interpretation of those tests, and that's why we rely on Great Plains and why we rely on um, uh, real-time labs testing to see if there are mold toxins that are still in you. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, Doug. Hello, David. Let's see. Are eye floaters associated with Lyme, BART, Babesia, or mold toxicity? Do they go away on their own? How do I get rid of them? I've had them for a few years now and they fluctuate in severity throughout time. All right, so number one, uh, floaters generally are benign, okay? I just want you to know that. But if you have floaters, you should at least get examined one time by your eye doctor to make sure that you're not getting into problems of your retina at the back of the eyeball, okay? All right, now, can these various infections lead to some eye floaters? Yes. And I think they all can, even the mold toxicity, although I tend to see floaters more with Lyme and Bartonella, but I think all of these conditions can, okay? Sometimes as you treat, they will get better, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, David. Hello, TJ. Are oxalates the part of this Lyme disease puzzle, and should I be doing something about them? Um, for 99.999% of people, oxalates are not part of the problem. Um, I know there are some doctors out there that have theories about that, but um, even uh, even when I if I've got somebody that I, I think has oxalate sensitivities, I pull the food those foods out and they feel better, it doesn't often result in them getting through their Lyme treatment any differently, okay? All right. Good luck to you. Hello, Alex. Let's see, what are your thoughts regarding the Quest Labs test for Lyme? Do you find it accurate? I know you recommend Igenix. My new Lyme doctor had me test with Quest Labs for Lyme and uh, TGF beta one. What would be the purpose for testing for TGF beta one? Never heard of this. All right. So TGF beta one is a type of cytokine and it tends to be, I'm sorry, a type of anti-cytokine. It's a cytokine that, that goes up to help lower inflammatory cytokines, okay? All right. So if it's elevated, it means your body is working to decrease inflammatory cytokines. So he was using it as a way probably to see if you have elevated cytokines in general, even though this is a good one, 
if it's up, it's up for a reason. It's combating the not good inflammatory cytokines, okay? Now, it could be elevated uh, either from mold toxicity triggering it, um, or it could be elevated from um, Lyme and tick-borne infections triggering it, okay? But that's probably, I would assume, that's why your doctor tested it. I don't know for sure. I don't know your doctor, but I would assume that's probably what they were doing. In terms of Lyme testing, so I, the... Um, Quest Labs and LabCorp, Pack Lab, all the major systems in the country use a test kit to test for Lyme that is approved for resale by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Okay, now it's approved to be resold to different companies. That does not mean the FDA has done anything to prove they're accurate. It just means that the lab producing these tests has certain quality standards in place to produce the test. And the FDA says, we approve it, send it out. You can sell it to others, okay? The test kits that all of these companies are using are designed based on the recommendations for the United States Center for Disease Control and the Infectious Disease Society of America. And under their testing protocol, they say that you should do a two-step test. Step one of their blood test has to be positive before you get to step two of their blood test, okay? In step one of their blood test, they do a test called an ELISA, which is a screening test to see, is your immune system making antibodies that could attach, might be made against the Lyme germ? It's a could test, okay? And it's a, I, the idea behind a could test is to throw a big net out there and figure out, is there anything that looks like Lyme in you uh, from an immune reaction standpoint? And if so, then we want to clarify if that you really are having a reaction against the Lyme germ. And that, for that, they use a Western blot as part of that, okay? So the Western blot is an immune test also. And what that does is it looks to see is your immune system making antibodies against certain proteins that are found on the covering of the Lyme germ? Okay. All right. Now, the ELISA test using this FDA approved test kit has to be positive before you get to do the Western blot. The trouble is the ELISA test will miss Lyme 50% of the time. It's a horrible screening test. It shouldn't even be used. Okay. But that's what they recommend. One of the problems with it is you have to keep in mind that these tests still use in their, um, in trying to figure out if you have an immune reaction, they're relying on the original strain of Lyme from the 1970s. The original East Coast strain, okay? Well, guess what? We're in 2022. <laughs> we're, we're 50 years almost down the road, and we are still only testing against the original strain of Lyme from the 1970s, all right? You can already see what a problem might be there. More and more, we have other strains that are, that are causing problems in this country, okay? And we're not really testing against them. So, for instance, out on the East Coast of the United States, a number of the European strains have worked their way across the ocean. All right. So out on the East Coast, and this is up into the eastern provinces, uh, Maritimes of Canada as well, um, there are factions due to um, uh, something called uh, Borrelia afzali and uh, Borrelia uh, uh, guarinii. Uh, those are European strains that have come over, okay? And they're starting to be a bigger factor in uh, what is Lyme on the East Coast. And this two-step test of doing ELISA and the Western blot doesn't adequately pick up these other strains, okay? So that's one reason they're not good. This, uh, all right, and they're only using the original strain too, okay? So the Western blot, if they were to do that originally, that FDA-approved test kit through Quest has the ability to find Lyme if it's in you about 65% of the time. That's it. Not that good, okay? All right. All right, so then let's look at Igenix. Why do I advocate Igenix? Well, Igenix does a better test, all right? And through Igenix, there's two tests you might do. One is called their Western blot, or you might do their newer test called the Immunoblot, which is really the better test, okay? In their Western blot, they basically are growing two strains of Lyme, the original East Coast strain and a West Coast strain, and they kill them. 
And then they take antibodies from your blood and they see, do they attach to those proteins found on the covering of the germ? Okay, but it's two strains, okay? For the new immunoblot, what they're doing is they're, ta they're growing proteins in the lab from eight different kinds of Lyme germs. All right, so it's a bigger fingerprint, all right? And of those eight, there's the Borrelia burgdorferi, the kind that's predominant here in the States. There's uh, Borrelia fcelli, Borrelia gurinii, and, and five other strains, all right? So they're looking to see if you have antibodies against more strains. That makes it a better test. The other thing that they do is they have genetically modified these proteins when they grow them in the lab to remove pieces that might falsely attach and hold on to antibodies made against viruses. In other words, they're removing any possibility that when you get a positive test, it's really because you made antibodies against viruses that happen to attach to the Lyme antibodies. So their way of doing it, although it's more expensive, it's more accurate. It has the ability to find Lyme if it's there 95% of the time. And when it finds it, it's right 100% of the time. So one of the problems with the um, Quest and LabCorp and Packed Lab FDA approved test kits is when those come back positive, there's still a chance they're wrong because they're really detecting antibodies against chronic viruses, for instance, okay? So although Igenix is more expensive, it's the best test out there. And um, that's what I tend to go with because of that, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Alex. Hello, Brandy. Let's see, you mentioned that you have two parents in their 90s. Are there any support supplements that you had them taking that you recommend for people of their age? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> so when I was gone the last two weeks, I actually made a big road trip. Um, uh, I was at a conference originally in San Diego, but then I had to fly out, um, out to the Midwest and uh, picked up a camper van out there, actually, and drove it from Michigan down to Indiana to see mom for three days. And then eventually um, wandered around and wound up in Colorado Springs to see dad. And uh, both my parents are challenged at this point. They're both in uh, nursing homes. Um, the one thing I would say, neither one of them are big supplement takers, okay? So I, I just want you to know that. For people in their 90s and even in their 80s, there's a few things I do recommend, though. Number one, if we look at studies about what gives longevity to the elderly and quality of life, we can look at what are known as the blue zones. These are certain cities like Loma Linda. Um, there is a, a city, there's a city in Greece. There's a city in Japan. There's a number of cities where they've looked at people from across the world where people live a long time and they've tried to figure out what are the key factors behind that, okay? And what their key factors, there's three big key factors. Number one, regular exercise. Stay mobile as much as you can, okay? And I'm happy to report that my dad especially, even at almost 91, does everything he can to stay active. He climbs stairs even though he needs to hold on to something. He's out doing that. My mom, on the other hand, at this point cannot. Um, she had a stroke and that's left her a little bit of a difficult situation there, okay? But until she had that stroke a few years ago, she was very active physically as well too. So number one, stay physically active, try to do some exercise, okay? Number two, um, try to eat a, a, as much as you can of plant-based or Mediterranean style diet. Those are anti-inflammatory diets, okay? And then the third big thing is having very active social networks. They call it the wine at five, right? Where you get together with your friends and you have a glass of wine, all right? Because you've got this rich community. So for instance, my father um, is in Colorado Springs and he's repeatedly asking me, I wanna move out to Seattle where you are. And I repeatedly tell him, no. <laughs> Not that I am trying to be an evil son, but um, uh, he would be kind of hard to have around, but to be truthful. But 
the main reason I'm, I'm telling him to stay there is although he's in a nursing home and although I talked him into getting rid of his car a year ago because he was about ready to kill people with it, what he has in Colorado Springs is this just wildly active social group. He is heavily involved in his church and used to be heavily involved in the Colorado Mountain Club. He is integrated in that community like you cannot believe. And even without a car, he now has people that drive him everywhere two to three times a day. And even though he's in this assisted living facility, people come and grab him, take him out for lunch. He's active as heck in the church, okay? And so that is life-giving and life-extending for somebody that's elderly, okay? All right? So those are the big things that I would recommend to anyone separate from taking supplements, okay? Now, other things that you can do that actually help are vitamin D on a regular basis, especially if you're above the 45th parallel. Vitamin D can act as a super hormone to keep you functioning. Other things to consider, but you would have to talk with physicians about this, can sometimes be doing um, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Um, those are sometimes can be helpful, okay? Uh, but that has to be done under the guidance of somebody too, okay? But the major things are not drugs and they're not supplements. The major things are physical activity, eating a healthy diet, and remaining social as long as you can. Those are the things. If you look at Loma Linda, you look at, um, I think it's Sardinia, if I'm right, and some there's some city in Japan. They're called the Blue Zones. You can Google the Blue Zones. You'll, you'll run into this book. Those are the things they found that add to longevity. Okay. So those are the things I would encourage you to take a look at too. All right. Thanks for that question, Brandy. Hello, Alex. Can treating mold toxicity with binders reactivate Lyme, BART, or Babesia? Um, the answer is I have not seen it do that. And, and again, I've been doing this since, um, I guess, 2004, <laughs> coming, coming up on my 20 years of doing this. But uh, no, I haven't, I haven't seen that happen. Now, keep in mind, pulling mold toxins out is going to trigger a cytokine act, or it's going to, moving the, the toxins, as I discussed with our first question tonight, is going to trigger um, cytokines. All right, which can look like a reactivation of your mole, um, of your Lyme, Bartonella, or Babesia, because most of their symptoms are cytokine symptoms. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Alex. Hello, Sharon. Let's see. You mentioned once that 10 or even 15% of some folks do not get better or recover from Lyme. Are you able to speculate on from what you've seen why that might be? Boy, I don't know. That's that's the million dollar question. You know, it, for the long, the current Vogue idea that we have, <laughs> I said it's in Vogue because that's the way the line world works. We uh, we go all run down a pathway for a while and see if it works. Um, but the current idea that we think uh, that makes it difficult for people to get over uh, chronic Lyme is this idea of having persisters where some of the germs go into hibernation and making it hard for regular antibiotics to treat them. And that's why many of us are doing things to deal with those persisters or hibernating forms at this time, okay? Now, having worked with aggressively now at dealing with persisters for about three years or more, I have to say that for some people, it does make a difference, whether you use their the disulfiram, you put them on a dapsone regimen, uh, you use the liposomal cinnamon clove oregano that I talk about. You use methylene blue. Uh, you use cryptolepis. You use Japanese knotweed. You use cat's claw. All those things are things that you might do to get it persisters. For the, a group of people, that is that does make a difference, okay? But that's not the whole 10 to 15%. Other reasons that people may not get well, and some of these come to us from the Infectious Disease Society of America, even though... They hold a viewpoint that anyone that hasn't gotten better after one month of antibiotics, uh, they believe that they call that post-Lyme. Uh, they don't believe that you can have chronic infection. I disagree with them. But they do have a theory that for some people, the reason they don't recover is that it might be uh, an autoimmune illness triggered by Lyme. That's a possibility. Okay. Another reason people may not get better, a theory that people have postulated, is that 
um, that your immune system has a hard time uh, getting rid of the dead germ debris or the DNA of the germ and keeps reacting against it. Okay, so the germ may no longer be active and live in you, but you can't clear it and your immune system stays inflamed from that. Okay, there's some theories about that as well too, okay? There is also another theory that people, um, and I, I hate this theory, but I'm gonna just throw it out, is that, that there are some people that have learned um, uh, illness where basically they um, have, uh, have taken on the state of being ill because that's what they know, not because they, uh, I don't wanna say it's all in their head, but there is a learned behavior they take on that keeps them from getting better. And I, I, I just said, I don't know that I agree with that, okay? But I just wanna know that's another theory that's out there, okay? Um, other theories for what could be happening at 10 to 15% is there are some other chronic infections that we've missed. Um, anyhow, those are some thoughts. Um, um, and some of it may just be we have dysfunctional immune systems that can't get rid of the active germs too. And that's an area where many of us are starting to work with peptides and see if that will make a difference, okay? But it's a theory, okay? All right, good luck to you, Sharon. Hello, Chris. Hi, Dr. Ross. Have any of your patients had vertigo, room spins, or dizziness related to Lyme or BART? Have any seen a resolution of those symptoms? If so, how or what type of specialist did they see? I've been diagnosed with a right labyrinth dysfunction and several what seemed like positional vertigo spells. However, Meniere's vestibular migraine, uh, benign postural vertigo, cervical spine, head shaking, and vestibular insufficiency have been ruled out, along with other blood work. Getting different PCPs to consider Lyme as a possibility hasn't been productive. Appreciate your thoughts. So could Lyme lead to a neurologic dysfunction leading to vertigo? Yes, Bartonella can too. Clearly you've had a full workup. They're looking for anything. I have seen people with Bartonella that will have these negative workups in Lyme that have these negative workups. And if we do get their Lyme or Bartonella under control, the vertigo does get better. Not always, uh, but a lot of time it does. So could that be a reason for this? Yeah, could be. Doesn't mean it is, but it could be. It could be one of the reasons. The other thing that sometimes could be helpful in situations like this is a skilled acupuncturist um, can make a big difference. And also there are um, uh, vestibular physical therapists that have ways of, of teaching your brain to think differently, to react differently, uh, to come out of the vertigo kind of position as well too, okay? So uh, consider both of those as well too, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Chris. Hello, Astrid. I'm curious to know your opinion about SOT treatment. I'm not sure what I sure I want to send my blood to Greece. Um, boy, I, I think at this point, the best I can say is it um, it has no proof at all that it works. And I think that it's very suspect what number of my colleagues are doing by doing this to patients. And also it's very suspect what uh, this Greek company is doing as well too, okay? Now, let me say more about that. So supportive oligonucleotide therapy, everybody, is using um, uh, genetic building blocks, DNA building blocks called nucleotides. And they're being used to um, block uh, uh, replication within the cells of the germ by blocking the genetic blueprint that tells these germs to replicate, okay? So this involves the, and, and how it supposedly works is somebody draws your blood and they send it off to Greece where they develop these nucleotides. And in Greece, they are doing PCR DNA testing to try to identify what germs are in your blood, okay? 
And once they have identified what germs are in your blood using their PCR DNA test, they then try to develop a blocking DNA or blocking RNA, blo blocking genetic code to block the production of those germs in your cells. And then they send that back to the US. And then in the US, you get that injected in you. Okay. Now, there are major problems along the pathway with this. All right. Number one, I've, and I've written back and forth to, to Greece to get their opinions on this, okay? Their method of determining if you have germs in you at best will only identify germs when they're in you about 60% of the time. In other words, when you send blood to them, if they send something back, I don't know if they're sending you something based on their testing or not. And even if they are, and they say you don't have a germ in you, maybe you still do. Because <laughs> I know I, I, all these SOT people are like, I'm getting better because my PCR test came back better. And it's like, well, it doesn't mean anything because it will miss it 30% of the time, okay? So my question is, what are they sending you? I mean, I, if they got a test that's inaccurate 30% of the time, what are they sending you, okay? All right, that's one thing, all right? Number two, there is nothing that they have done research-wise that proves that this genetic blocking code even can get into the cells and work there, okay? So our body is designed to break down these nucleotides, all right? So by comparison, think about the COVID vaccine that we all, you know, many of us got, all right? And think about the extremely cold temperatures that that vaccine had to be sent to us, all right? Those vaccines were made up of genetic blocking code, genetic material. And it was so unstable, everything had to be frozen practically or extremely cold to get this to you. I doubt that that's how this stuff is getting to you from Greece, all right? So I don't even know if it's, it doesn't degenerate by the time it gets here. Number two, once it gets in you, it has to get from your blood into the cells, all right? Our cells and our bloodstream are loaded with enzymes that try to break this stuff down. So I haven't seen any studies that prove this stuff even gets absorbed. All right. All right. Number three, there are no studies that have been done looking at SOT outcomes in Lyme. Now, I know there's some Lyme doctors, like there's a New York Lyme doctor that says there's proof that this works for infections. Well, guess what? It's not the Lyme infection they've looked at. <laughs> There are companies that have FDA approved drugs here in the States where they've gone through the safety studies for this genetic material they're injecting into you to show you that it's safe. And they've been able to show that it can help with certain infections, but they did studies that prove that, okay? What we do know right now is that this Greek company supposedly has done studies and they're working on a paper to publish to show us that this works, all right? But it hasn't been released yet. And there is no proof out there in any studies that I have seen that this has ever been shown to be helpful at all. No studies that have been done for Lyme. So I think there's a lot of questions here and people are spending $5,000 of treatment for something that has no science behind it right now for Lyme, has a lot of reasons it shouldn't work, and has an inadequate test that's being done to determine what they're going to send you. Boy, that's not where I want to spend my money. And I really have to question what my colleagues are doing that are out there um, doing this. I mean, I, I well, I'll, I'll, I'll hold my commentary. <laughs> I mean, if I'm open to seeing these papers when they finally get published. Now, even if they showed their paper that it works, you've got to be suspect if it's the same company that stands to financially benefit, that suddenly has a study that shows that it works. Well, gosh, there are a lot of biases in that. <laughs> I'm going to want to look at that study very carefully to make sure they haven't skewed the results in their favor too, okay? So anyhow, I'm not a big proponent of this at all, at all, not at all, all right? So let me, I've written a whole article about this that raises all these issues and even describes in better uh, detail how SOT could work, okay? Uh, let me just do a quick screen share for you. All right. 
there you go. That's my article. So SOT treatment for Lyme disease, uh, where I basically review uh, the claims, how it might work, and then I, I really review what are the problems here uh, with this idea, okay? All right. Hello, Gail. Let's see, I've most probably had Lyme and Borrelia uh, miyamoto I have mast cell activation syndrome. I cannot tolerate antibiotics. I've tried some herbal protocols and they are too strong when they are antimicrobial tinctures. I'm also told I have Bartonella, uh, Bartonella, Bartonella. What do you recommend? Oh boy, Gail. I don't have a single recommendation. Um, the, the, your situation is so complicated. I have to literally sit down with somebody and try to understand what, how reactive they are, what is triggering those reactions. It's a very detailed history that I need to get to be able to um, determine what, what good advice to give. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be able to give you good advice on this one, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Gail. Oops. Sorry about that, Bridget. I think I just got rid of your question trying to post it. I apologize for that. Hello, Nick. Let's see. Been dealing with chronic Lyme symptoms for a few years. For the last two to three years, I've had uh, new pain that started in the armpits and is now also bouncing around the arms, hands, shoulders, and chest. The pain comes and goes and also tends to move around and varies between sharp, dull, and burning. Muscle soreness, pains, twitching, etc., have been historical symptoms for me, but this particular type of pain starting from the armpit is new. I had a doctor check my lymph nodes around the arms and she detected no swelling. Is this likely a symptom of my chronic Lyme and Bartonella? What makes me suspect the BART is since around the same time I have also been having sharp pains in the soles of the feet and some a new urinary tract pain. All right. So uh, to give you a full answer, I, I'd have to ask you a lot of questions too, but I'll, let me make a few comments here. So um, Richard Horowitz, who has written um, a book, uh, he's, the, he's the person that came up with the Dapsone Regimen, but also uh, has written a book called Why Can't I Get Better? Um, he developed a questionnaire called the MSIDS questionnaire, which many of you have done, um, that looks to see, do you have enough risk factors for Lyme and do you have enough symptoms for Lyme? And then you score it up and figure out, do you have a high enough score? And if you have a high enough score, then we say you have Lyme, okay? In that questionnaire, he's done some validation studies, trying to see what key questions would be give you a clearer indication that you really have active Lyme. And this is just for the Lyme term, not for Bartonella, but Lyme Borrelia, okay? And what he found in it is that the wandering pains and wandering neuropathy are synonymous with having Lyme by testing, okay? So the wandering nature of things says to me Lyme here, okay? Lyme Borrelia here, okay? Now, could it be also be Bartonella? Possibly. Um, and so to figure out if it's Bartonella, you want to look and see, do you have enough Bartonella symptoms? All right. So Bartonella symptoms can be pain on the soles of the feet, can be various kinds of neuropathy, although mm -hmm. Lyme can give you neuropathy too. Uh, tremors and shakes, uh, internal vibrations, uh, where you feel it, no one else can see it. Uh, air hunger, feel like you can't get enough air from time to time. Um, and then having uh, neuropsych issues, like um, either severe, severe cognition, thinking problems it is, or uh, problems with um, having having problems with anxiety or depression, okay? Those are things that would tend to indicate active Bartonella as well too, all right? All right. Good luck to you, Nick. Hello, Sandra. Let's see, if you have chronic Lyme and Bartonella, can you treat both at the same time? Which herbs would you use and does it take much longer to heal? What kind of these bug, what 
which of these bugs cause neuropathy and burning feet? Thank you. So Sandra, both Lyme and Bartonella, Lyme being Borrelia and Bartonella, can give neuropathy and burning feet. Both of them can, okay? Can you treat both at the same time? Yes. Um, and so I will treat both at the same time. If I'm to do it herbally for my um, Lyme, I would wind up using Otoba and Cat's Claw. I like working with those two herbs. I find they help about 90, uh, 85 to 90% of the time. I give them the same chance of helping as a prescription antibiotic regimen, okay? Those would go after Borrelia Lyme, all right? For Bartonella, I like using uh, Sitta Okuda and Hutania. And um, I got the idea to use those out of Buner herbs. I find they work about 75 to 80% of the time. If you were to go prescriptively, you might find options that work 80 to 85% of the time, okay? But herbs give you a good chance too. And then to go after persister forms of Lyme and Bartonella, I would have you take a, a liposomal variety of cinnamon, clove, and oregano oil. And that is a product that's made by Dr. Inspired uh, Nutritionals. In fact, it tends to be the main thing I add into most of my treatments these days, whether they're prescription or not prescription to deal with persister forms of Bartonella and persister forms of Lyme. They also can go after growing and persister forms of Lyme and Bartonella as well too, okay? If you're looking for ideas about how to use all of those, take a look at my, um, my uh, Lyme treatment protocol, the, uh, under this Lyme protocol tab here, and take a look at uh, this tab number 11 for the Lyme infection recommendations. Take a look at this tab number 12 for the Bartonella uh, treatment section, okay? So here's, right here, I lay out how to use Hutania, Sita, Akuda, and the cinnamon, clove, oregano combination right there, okay? All right. Good luck to you. Hello, Sandra. Again, I think, let's see. Hello, Dr. Ross, thank you for all your help. I recently have had COVID pretty bad and have had Lyme and BART. It caused heart rhythm variability. Is this common with Lyme and COVID? Also, my doctor recommended Cryptolepis for Lyme and Bartonella. Is this effective and safe if I have had COVID recently? Thank you. So um, it's interesting, Cryptolepis, um, is an herbal medicine that historically most of us have used uh, for its anti-malarial effects and use it to treat babesia, okay? So where we learned about Cryptolepis is that the people in Ghana, Africa, uh, were using it to treat malaria. And we know that things that work on malaria can be quite a, usually good against babesia, so that's how we started using it. Last year, um, Johns Hopkins University published some studies looking at, in the laboratory, what herbs uh, might be useful against uh, uh, persister, lime, and bartonella, all right? And one of the herbs that they looked at was cryptolepis. And even though historically we've used it to treat babesia, based on their lab experiments, it did a great job killing growing lime and growing bartonella. It also did a good job of killing growing bartonella and persisting Bartonella as well too, okay? I'm sorry, it did a good job against persister Bartonella and Lyme and good job against growing Bartonella and Lyme in addition to being active against uh, Babesia, all right? So I incorporate it sometimes. Uh, my, my, more of my go-to still uh, drugs based on just, or I'm sorry, herbs based on benefit I've seen over time is to use the cinnamon clove, uh, is herbally to use cinnamon clove oregano as my persister agent, and then to use the Otoba Cascal for Lyme and the Sitakuda Hutania for Bartonella. I will sometimes start working with Cryptolepis into that mix if the underlying things I just said don't work, all right? But I don't start there, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Senator. That's not to say your doctor isn't wrong, wrong for trying it either, okay? It's just, I think we're all learning how to use these herbs 
uh, based on the, the, the more recent research that came out, okay? Hello, Liz. Hold on here a minute. Hi, Dr. Ross. Let's see. Thank you so much for taking the time to do these webinars. They are very helpful. My question is, do you think it's okay to take Cat's Claw and Otoba along with antibiotics of doxycycline or clarithromycin? Hold on a minute, let's see. Uh, my question is, do you think it's okay to take Cat's Claw and Otoba along with antibiotics, doxycycline, or clarithromycin? The answer is yes. I, I do that sometimes in my treatments, okay? Have any of your patients taking both the herbal supplement protocol for Lyme and the antibiotic protocol simultaneously? I have been taking doxycycline for the past five months and was also taking clarithromycin with doxy for several of those months. I also was taking cat's claw along with some other herbs such as cryptolepis, red sage, Chinese skullcap, elderberry, lithococcus, and Byronoite AL formula. Recently, I saw a post in a Lyme disease group which said cat's claw may make antibiotics less effective if taken together. So now I'm wondering if it's a mistake to take cat's claw or possibly some of the other herbs along with my antibiotics. What are your thoughts? So I, I'm not aware of that, uh, of any literature that says cat's claw makes the antibiotics work less well. I haven't seen any science that says that. And believe me, I read a lot of science, okay? So I, I'm not sure where they're coming up with that in the chat group. I often will start people, for instance, on a cat's claw in Otoba. And if we're not getting far enough along, but we've got some benefit, then I might add a doxycycline or a clarithromycin to it, okay? Also, sometimes I've got patients that are on a clarithromycin doxy and they're on other prescription antibiotics and they just want to lighten their uh, prescription antibiotic load, I might add in herbal antibiotics as a substitute. But I have no trouble mixing them together. And I find benefit doing it as well too, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you. Hello, Bart. Hello, Dr. Ross. I was taking doxycycline with azithromycin, also oregano oil and cinnamon clove one month for chronic Bartonella. After that, I want to change to herbal antibiotics only and stay on them. Is oregano oil and cinnamon clove with Sida Acuda Utania enough to stay on? Or is there anything I can add there to maximize success of the treatment that is natural? Also, what do you suggest for heel pain? I had it like nearly all day and it was much bigger than usual. I don't know if it was a herx or something, but it's annoying. Thank you for your time and knowledge. I'm learning a lot from your videos. Cheers. Oh, thanks, Bart. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it would help if I swallow correctly. <laughs> Just inhaled a bunch of spit there. <coughs> it should be okay. All right. So, um, you know, the heel pain is, is uh, usually Bartonella that we think gives pain in the front of the foot or under the ball of the foot, not heel pain. Okay, I'll just start by saying that, okay. Heel pain sounds inflammatory, um, which could be from any of the infections. So treating infections can help with that. In addition, you might work with anti-inflammatories. And the one I like is curcumin. Uh, I mentioned that earlier tonight, uh, the product by Thorne called Mariva 500. Okay, all right. And as I mentioned earlier, in terms of herbs that I like using to mix together to treat Bartonella that work well are Sidocuda hutinia and uh, the liposomal cinnamon clove oregano. I already showed you where you go look to see how to use those, okay? Could you add something else to that? Yeah, you could. And if I were to add something next, I would add either a Japanese knotweed, which also based on Johns Hopkins experiments seems to have benefit against uh, Bartonella and Lyme growing and persisters, or I might add a cryptolepis, or maybe both. I mean, I don't, I don't see any harm in doing all of them, to be honest with you, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Bart. Hello, 
Hello, Ryan. Let's see. I had a ton of neuropsych symptoms, derealization, anxiety, OCD, neck and head pain, sore throat, feeling hot, numbness in hands and feet. I am thinking Bartonella, but would Babesia or Borrelia cause these too? Um, so de derealization, anxiety, and OCD are generally Bartonella possibly Lyme, okay? Those, th those are where I would tend to go. I don't see Babesia as doing that, okay? All right. Yeah, and even the rest of your symptoms, too. I would put that more in the Bartonella and Lyme category, okay? okay. Thanks for your question. Hello, Ken. Let's see. Is there any relationship between chronic Lyme and adrenal function as to low cortisol? So um, chronic Lyme uh, can lead to adrenal dysfunction in a couple ways. Number one, uh, being under chronic stress from feeling ill can burn out the adrenal glands. Okay. So just the stress of the illness. Okay. All right. So that leads to adrenal fatigue and adrenal dysfunction. The second thing is uh, these excess cytokines uh, lead to uh, incorrect messages coming from the brain telling your adrenals to work correctly. So the cytokines can interfere with correct function of a part of your brain called the hypothalamus pituitary that is involved in regulating how your adrenal functions, okay? So both of those can be possibilities, yes. Good luck to you, Ken. Hello, Melissa. Do you have experience treating fasciculus um, My doctor just ordered biltricide. Oh, yeah. I'm so a parasite. Um, no, I don't. The specific one, I don't actually. Um, uh, so I, I can't comment. All right. Thank you. Hello, Bridget. Let's see. My immune system doesn't seem to take over after a decade of various treatments. I've been treating Lyme, co-infections, mold, gut health, heavy metals, et cetera, but can't get this under control. Is there a reason my body can't take over and is overreacting? I finally started trying LDI and still have severe neuro issues. IV antibiotics and herbals did next to nothing. BVT, uh, disulfiram, and ozone help more than anything else. I don't live in mold and I've addressed it with uh, uh, cholesteramine. Um, Bridget, I, it's hard for me to jump in the middle after you've done all these kinds of things to say what could be going on. Um, I'm not gonna be able to give you an answer. I, I would have, this is somebody I would have to do an hour and a half visit trying to figure it out, okay? So I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be able to give you a quick response on that. Uh, good luck to you. Let's see here. Hello, Molly. Let's see. I've noticed from talking to lots of Lyme disease folks, everybody seems to have a problem processing carbohydrates. What do you think is going on there? Um, I would need to know more what you mean by processing carbohydrates. I, I can't make any comment here. I'm not sure what, what they're saying and what the symptom problems are that they're having. Okay. That has not... Uh, people having difficulty with carbohydrates has not been a uniform thing I've seen in my practice. So I would want to know a little bit more about specific symptoms that you're talking about. Okay. All right. Good luck to you. Hello, Carter. Let's see, what are you suggesting or where are you referring patients with cranial instability? The GEMSET clinic in my area is starting to push people into having neck fusion surgery. 
is that something you recommend as well? Um, boy, that's a hard thing to say. I, it, it would be very depend, in de, dependent on the person and the degree of neck instability. So that's all I can say about that. And I, I don't know. Um, I haven't had a lot of people with uh, cervical instability. I suspect if Gemsec's looking for it, you'll find it. <laughs> But I haven't been looking for it, to be honest. I, I know that there are people, there's a theory out there that that's one of the reasons people might not get better. Um, so I haven't been referring for it. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, Carter. Hello, Reagan. Can Lyme, Babesia, Bart, or any of the other tick-borne infections cause a problem with taste and smell, or is that most likely a compounded case of COVID and are you aware of any treatments for long-term diminished taste and smell? So taste and smell, I haven't seen any uh, issues like that come up in the world of Lyme, Bartonella, or Babesia. I have had it happen with a number of my patients that got COVID, um, Generally, what we see with that is there is recovery over time. I am not aware of any specific um, uh, treatments for that, though. Okay. That's not to say there aren't any. I'm just not aware of them. Okay. All my patients that had this as a problem got better over time. All right. Thanks, Ray. Hello, Robert. Let's see. I don't currently have any skin rashes per se, but when I get in the shower, I feel like so much of my skin exfoliates in layers. Have you seen this before? Is the infection setting up shop for the skin or am I storing toxins there? Uh, Robert, I don't have an explanation for you. Um, I got to tell you, there's a number of things we see in different individuals that have Lyme that I, are not common in everyone. Uh, that's not to say they're not part of the illness. It's just I haven't seen this occur uh, in somebody. So I, I don't have a comment on it. Okay. Or I'm not sure why it's happening, I should say. All right. Good luck to you. Hello, Robert. Let's see. I've had Lyme disease for a few years, but I had uh, a mast cell activation event that lasted about 10 minutes where there was a lot of vibration, electrical shocking at the rear base of my neck, where my skull attaches in this lime. Is this lime or something else trying to school up to penetrate the brain barrier? Or is this some type of shingles activation and all of the peripheral nerves just, boy, I don't know. I went, I, I, I'm not sure if I would venture to guess on that one, all right? I might have a better idea if I can ask you a bunch of other questions, but I obviously I can't in this format. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, Robert. Hello, Mary. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Thanks again for all that you do. Does Seftin work for Lyme that is impacting the central nervous system? If so, what would be the effective dosing? So Seftin is a medicine that is in the family called um, cephalosporins. It's also known, it's also this, uh, Seftin is also called cefuroxime. It is a useful agent at crossing over into the brain. It is useful against one kind of Lyme and, uh, or one form of the Lyme, and that is the spirochete. And basically, it uh, blocks the ability for the germ to repair its covering as the covering gets injured from just being. And eventually, you develop holes in the covering and the germ dies, basically, okay? Amoxicillin does something similar. Penicillins do something similar. If you are to use it, you want to combine it with something that will get at Lyme that lives inside of cells, um, and also at cyst Lyme. So usually we'll combine it from a prescription standpoint with one of the azoles, like a metronidazole, which is flagyl, or tinidazole. I might even use one of the azoles that we tend to orient more towards yeast, but can help here too, like a fluconazole, for instance, okay? 
For Ceftin dosing for most problems, it's a 500 milligram twice a day dose. Um, I usually will even start some of my Lyme patients there. Uh, if I want to make sure I'm getting stronger nerve penetration in the brain, I might do a thousand milligrams uh, two times a day on that. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Mary. All right, everyone, that's it. I know there's a lot more questions here, but um, we spent about an hour and a half here tonight and um, I've got uh, two Basinjis that are gonna start knocking on my my door here, trying to say, let's go. So, well, actually they're pretty much asleep there right now, but <laughs> it's time to still go walk my Basinjis and to walk me actually too. Uh, so I've enjoyed being here with you tonight. Um, Take a look at your email in the morning, somewhere before 9, 9.30 in the morning, I should have sent out an email to you with a summary of what we talked about tonight and a link to the webinar. Um, I invite you to help me spread the word about this and to help others. So if you would please send that on to other people that might benefit as well too. Also in that email, be a chance to sign up for next week's webinar. So if you forward the email with the video link, You'll also be forwarding the invite to these other people too. So invite people. A lot of people get benefit from these and I want to reach as many people as possible. Okay, so I invite you to help me. All right. Good night, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye.